Hi guys, it's Braylon and welcome back. I am pumped for this video. It's gonna be short, it's gonna be small, but I think it's something that's very important. Um, I just wanna put a disclaimer that anything on my channel is uh, my idea, but sometimes um, where I work, we talk about these topics a lot. There's so many special ed teachers and um, therapists, counselors that work where I work, and we're constantly evolving and adding in um, resources and visuals and all of those things. And so these are, yes, these are my ideas, but sometimes they're influenced by people around me, and um, that's okay. I wanna talk today about visual supports that can be used in behavior management. Now that sounds weird. When you think of behavior management, you think of what kind of structures and systems are in place in your classroom. And when you think of visuals, you think of, you know, kids who are nonverbal and who need to communicate. But a lot of times visuals and behavior go hand in hand and you can reference the visuals when you're trying to manage certain behaviors. So I have a couple of examples, a couple of things I wanna show you, and um, I'm definitely gonna link below where I got them from. I do wanna say that anytime I talk about things on my channel, if they are paid products, I will only ever recommend products that are like eight to five dollars or less. Mostly, they're products that I did not create. Occasionally, I'll put a product that I did make, but most of the time, they're products that are from other people, and I link them below. I also try to link an equal amount of free products. So if you watch any of these videos and you wanna take any of these ideas, and you don't wanna pay any money, I link them below on Teachers Pay Teachers, and they're mostly free. I try to do about five to 10 free products and three to five paid products that are not expensive. Being a teacher, being a special ed teacher is expensive enough with the other supplies that you need to buy. I make these videos for free <laughs> and I try to link as many free things so that you guys have access to everything. And I'm hoping that for any of you um, students or paras, people who are in the process of joining in this career, that you find these videos helpful and that you find the resources to be helpful so that um, in the future when you finally have your classroom, you'll be all set. Again, if you're in special ed, then you've seen this a gabillion times, but the most, one of the most important tools, I would say for me, um, would be a first then chart. This tells um, basically everything. What's gonna happen first and what's next. This makes your expectations very clear. If a kid is confused and they don't understand language and they're naturally more aggressive and they're feeling kind of uneasy about what comes first in the routine and what comes next, this could easily have a cute picture that you place right there. A more advanced version would be a first and then a next and then a then. So there's three in a row. These are for kids who can sequence more. Um, this one is already created. So first is circle time, next would be table work, and then you get your Play-Doh. Making it clear, this is what you're doing first, this is what you're doing second, this is what you're doing third. And that way they know exactly where they're supposed to be. Let me give you a scenario. This is something that happens in my classroom every single day. A kid gets upset, they get frustrated, they start to get a little bit aggressive, they stand up and they try to run out of the classroom. They just start, it's called a lope. When they try to elope and they run away, or they just wanna avoid their problems, or they start getting aggressive, a lot of times people will speak to the kid, but when you're that angry and you're that dysregulated, and you have trouble with communication, your brain cannot process language. There's a reason why we have visuals. There's a reason why teachers and counselors and speech therapists, why they tend to use minimal language. And it's because when someone is that dysregulated and upset, their brain cannot process communication via the language or the spoken word. A lot of times a calming mechanism would be to show them a first and a then. So 
For example, when kids run out of my room, they get all upset, they get all angry, heated. I have things like this placed all around my classroom and in the hallways. It has these picture cards and they're not the usual picture cards. Some of them are line up, make a choice, work by yourself, sit at a table, stop, clean up sit on the floor and be quiet. Now, these are not schedule cards. These are calming choices. So when a kid is dysregulated, he's having a full on tantrum on the floor, in the hallway, people are walking around, they're all confused. Why are you not managing your kid? Why don't you get your kid up, take your student somewhere else? I try not to flood them with language. I might pick stop off of this and then I might pick quiet off of this. And I might very calmly show the student, you know what, first stop and use a calm voice. First stop, you know what, then you'll be quiet. And I wait and I won't say it more than once. I let the communication set, like I said, they don't understand the language right now, a dysregulated kid. I'll start and if they're still upset the next time I say it, I will point to the pictures. Eventually it will get through and I don't have to talk too much. It's a reinforcer. It's a very clear way to show what you expect. So the kid's quiet. Well, you know what? Now I need them to prove that they're calm and then I need to get them to do something. They're in the middle of the hallway, but this isn't safe. They need to go to a better place. So I might say first, sit in the chair. I might pull up a chair for them. All right, now I know your body is safe. Next, I'm gonna give you some choices. Here are some options of what you can do next. Then we move on from there. Having too much language when trying to manage behavior is the absolute worst way to go about it. If someone is not listening, a kid is defiant, and you start raising your voice, raising your voice, raising your voice, getting angry, getting angry, getting angry, it doesn't work. And it will come back to butt you in the butt. There is no way that that, that behavior is being settled. If you want a kid to do something, you have to teach them how to do it. You can't expect them to know it. I think a lot of times, especially when the kids get older, we expect them to know how to stand in line, to know how to do work at a table, to know how to ask for help. In early childhood, which is like my forte, um, we know that we have to teach every expectation because the kids are young, they come into school for the first time, but once they're older, you still have to teach them. Sometimes at the beginning of the school year, you're reteaching and reteaching what you expect kids to do. And I think making that abundantly clear, before you even begin anything, you have to teach them what you expect. Do you expect them to come in to your classroom and sit at a table and complete work? What do you expect them to do when they work in a group project? What do you expect them to do when they line up? How do you expect them to ask for help? How do you expect them to ask to go to the bathroom? How do you expect them to ask for a glass of water? What are your expectations? And make them abundantly clear from the beginning. Now, this is definitely geared more towards special ed, but I do think that general ed teachers or really any teacher might um, benefit from this, especially if you have a kid in your classroom um, that does have some sort of disability, specifically a language, communication, whether that's autism or just some delays. Now, more than ever, our classes are um, diverse and they're full of inclusion opportunities. Um, this seems very like kiddish, but this is actually like the best thing ever. How to sit, how to listen, what to do when you want them to work. This is the expectation of what happens in class. This seems so basic, but it's so clear. Anything like this, you can find this free on the internet. Something to remind a kid of um, what you expect them to do at their seat. Now I know special ed teachers are like, oh, bah, we know how to do this. If you do, of course, but then this might not be geared for you. This may be geared more towards students, grad students, paras, parents, anybody. Making the visual super clear. I know you need to sit, you need to listen, you need to work, your hands you keep to yourself, and your feet are on the floor. Easy. So 
My students do use the zones of regulation. If you've never heard of that before, I'm gonna link it down below. But basically it goes through what you feel when you're like really good and you're in your best place, you're in the green zone. You're starting to eh, kind of make some choices but still trying to be okay. You're in the yellow zone. Blue is like, I'm ups I'm a little sad, I'm down, but I'm not necessarily scary, aggressive, or unsafe. That's blue. And then red is kind of like, you know what, the choices I'm making are leading to being a little bit unsafe. I'm starting to get aggressive. And it's a way for kids to process how they're feeling. Um, a lot of kids in my room are triggered by the red. I don't know why. I think because it reminds them of stop, it reminds them of something bad or whatever. So when I use the zones, when I get to the red zone, sometimes I represent it with white because I just am like, you know what, this is unsafe, it's neutral. But that's just my personal preference. Some people really like using the red. Um, but one of these things, this is from Purpose Purpose Driven Teaching, I believe. I'm going to link it below. This product is only a dollar, <laughs> so I feel fine about linking a paid product for you. Um, but this is like something to hold up when it's like, oh, you're making a great choice. You're in the green zone. You're calm. And then when a kid is starting to not make such a good choice, instead of embarrassing them in front of their peers or instead of yelling at them, redirecting them again and again and again, let them have some space to understand that they might not have made the best choice. Sometimes I show them this, just the yellow, and she just made these, so I've been using them a lot, and they're so awesome. This one says pause and think about your actions. So a kid's getting dysregulated, or they're not complying with what you want them to do. You pull them aside, you show them this. Let's brainstorm what we should be doing. This behavior management and using visuals is a lot of work because it's the teacher who has to drive it. Eventually the kid will get comfortable, they'll regulate themselves, and they'll be able to reference their own visuals. But at the beginning, it's up to the teacher to drive the behavior management with the visuals they're using. It takes a lot of work. And the last thing is instead of red, I like to use the white ones, which is, you know what, you're not making the best choice. Please stop and make a better choice. Please stop and think about what you're doing. You're breaking pencils. You're throwing papers on the ground. You know what? Stop and let's think about it and why. These I really, really do love. I laminated them so that they last longer, but um, it's a great, great product. Oops, <laughs> fell on me. You might teach what's expected at the beginning. You might make kids practice it, you might go over it again and again and again, but there's bound to be one or two kids who still don't understand. You have flexible seating in your classroom and you've made it very clear how they should treat the, the seats and the chairs, but there are two kids who are still unable to do it. Yes, you might get frustrated, it might become a little annoying, but in the long run, maybe there is something they don't understand or they have um, an inability to control their impulses. They're literally impulsive and they don't fully realize what they're doing. Sometimes you might need an additional visual to help support what you're trying to teach. So for example, any any speech therapist has these um, or you can find any of these online, the pictures like the PEX pictures, the picture exchange program, um, anything like that. So some of my kids really struggle with using the iPad. And when they use the iPad or the tablet, it ends up being a whole big issue. They're standing up, they're walking around with the tablet. They're not going to the best websites or they start to throw the tablet everywhere or whatever. Instead of me initially getting upset and frustrated because it's expensive, <laughs> I take a moment and I try to assume the best. They're not trying to hurt my feelings. They're not trying to offend me. They just might not remember what they're supposed to do with the iPad. So I would have something like this posted on the wall or near their desk where they're using the iPad. And it goes through what is expected. Here you have the iPad. You should be sitting. You should be working and playing. You keep it on the table. There's a visual of an iPad on the table. When you're done, you clean up and then you go back and your feet are safe, your hands are safe, and your mouth is quiet. Now I know this seems kind of like babyish, but even an older kid would need a reminder every once in a while about what to do with a tablet or an iPad. 
There are ways to take this idea and make a better visual that fits with your older kids. Like I said, this is for special ed, but obviously general ed teachers could use this as well. How about something as simple as a worksheet? Say you're um, a general ed teacher, you hand out a project, you teach a fifth grade class, um, they're supposed to complete a worksheet together, but there are two kids who are just like not completing it, they're rolling on the floor, um, they're crumpling up the page, that might be that they're being rude. But to assume best intention, maybe they need a reminder of the routine. Yelling at them, um, using some type of, you know, clip chart is not going to work. Um, threatening to call their mom is not going to make a difference. Um, taking away something important to them probably won't work. <laughs> what will work is one, holding them accountable for the work that they've missed, and two, reminding them of what you expect. No, you are not in trouble. You just need to get back to work. Don't worry. But if you don't remember, here is what the what we're supposed to be doing with the worksheet. You should be sitting. You should be getting your materials. Again, listen to my directions. Let's do the worksheet, let's clean up, and let's be safe. The last thing I wanna say, and I've mentioned this probably in every video of some kind, on my wall in my classroom, I have pictures of what it means to be safe while listening, how to listen to somebody as they talk, what does that mean? How do you stay engaged? Um, I also have them on little rings so I can flip the card and I can show a kid when I feel like they need a reminder. Um, I have I have picture versions. So here's a bigger version where um, you don't even have to put it on a picture card. You can just have it here. This is what it means. Our feet are calm. Our hearts. What is our brain doing? Our hands are down and flat. Our eyes are looking up. Our mouths are quiet. Or um, this is another version of it where the kid is sitting down and it's pointing to the different parts of the body. And it's very clear. A lot of times I don't even verbally tell them anything. You're not listening. You're actually being kind of rude. <laughs> you're not talking to me. You're not... Um, you're talking while the teacher's talking. You know what? I'm not going to waste my breath. I'm not going to remind you again and again. I'm just going to point to the picture and I'm going to wait for it to click in your head because I want you to be reminded of what I expect and I don't want to have to keep verbally telling you what I expect because that's not realistic. That's not able to be generalized through all settings and in the long run, it doesn't benefit anybody. <laughs> I hope that this was helpful, that this was not scrambled at all. Again, if you're a general ed teacher, a special ed teacher, you've been doing this for a long time, these make perfect sense to you. This video is not for you. This video is for our students, for paras, for parents who are trying to understand visuals, for other people, this is what this is meant for. So I hope this was helpful. Please let me know if there are other visuals you use. Um, link them down below. Let's start a conversation. If you want to ask me more questions, please feel free to email me um, or um, send me a message on Instagram. I will always check and make sure I'm responding to them. Um, thank you so much for watching. Bye.